Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Happy New Year to you. This is uh, that moment in the winter season where we say goodbye to the holidays. Uh, You know, we take down the decorations. Our focus begins to change. Mariah Carey returns to hibernation until next Christmas. And we literally uh, are just kind of into, we're, we're right now off to the races in 2021. So I want to wish you the very best in this new year. I have to laugh. One of the highlights, really, one of the funniest moments that I can think of these past couple years is, uh, is what I was calling my, the 2020 vision, uh, going into the previous year that, you know, we had our 2020 vision set. And unfortunately, um, 2020 had a different idea of what was about to happen in 2020. Nobody knew what kind of season we were entering into. We did get clarity. We did get 2020 vision, but not necessarily the kind of vision we were expecting. We got clarity into what we fear. We got clarity into what we value. We got clarity into what we hope in. And so I do feel that this past year we have reasons to give thanks in the midst of everything that we walk through. And so I want to be sure that we are mindful of that. As we kick off this new season, we are kicking off a new series today called Win the Day. And, uh, and this is based on a book by our good friend, Pastor Mark Batterson. This book is really just about, when, when, uh, when he talked to me about how he was writing this book and preparing this, and it was basically released just a few days ago, um, you know, I thought this would be a great way for us to start our new year. Pastor Mark is also going to be with us on January 24th, so even better to be able to have him close out this series uh, around the themes that he has written about in his book. And so I really want to encourage you. The, the heart of this series, Win the Day, is basically how do we go into this new year prepared to live in God's best for our lives? Because God will want to bless us. I really believe that. What we just sang about is so true. But there is a part of us that needs to receive that. It needs to say yes to it. And so that's what I think this series is really about. How do we live in God's best for this coming year? Thomas Carlyle said this, Our grand business, undoubtedly, is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. And that, I think, is really the focus as we talk about these few weeks of win the day, is how do we do what lies clearly at hand for us to do? And so I want to give you a text today. I want to look to the scriptures, and I want to to kind of focus on a story of a miracle that Jesus performed. And I want to use this as our launching point into the new year as we talk about win the day. So turn with me to John chapter 5. If you're watching, and you are, I mean, that's the only reason. Maybe you're listening, I suppose. But if you're watching, you can, you can kind of follow along on the screen as we put it up there for you. It says this, Jesus returned to, to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And this was a superstition that they had had that whoever got to the pool first would be healed. So Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Let's pray together. Wherever you are, let's just agree with me in prayer. Father, today I thank you for your word. There's so many things that we need. We need the comfort of friends. We need connection and community. We need provision. Uh, Lord, the, 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 we, need, uh, we need peace today in our hearts. There's so many things that we could ask for, Lord, but it all comes, Lord, as we receive your word to our hearts. So I pray that this word that gives life would find a home in our hearts today as we receive it gladly and obediently. I pray this in Jesus' name. 
And everybody said, amen. Amen. We've been saying that a lot today. Amen. But it's the right word to start off this year. I want to talk to you just two points today of what it's going to take for us to begin to win the day. The, the book that Pastor Mark wrote is broken into basically three separate movements, and we're going to talk about those things in these three weeks, and then Pastor Mark is going to be here to close us out. But I, I want to kind of use the book and its content as the, as the springboard into what I want to share today. And so the first thing that I want to talk about that's necessary if you, want, you and I want to live in God's best for this coming year is that we learn how to flip the script. <laughs> Flip the script. That means to rethink or to rewrite your story. Now, I know that's an interesting way to talk about it because when we think about this past year and all of the experiences we had, we have a probably maybe even a a, somewhat of a traumatic experience. I think that's actually probably the closest thing that we could look at. And many people were traumatized by this year. And as we remember it, many of us are looking back thinking, man, I don't know if I can remember, if I even want to remember what happened in this past year. Or maybe there are other things in your life that you could look to and say, you know what, I've been trying to forget those things. And here is what I really believe that God's, God's plan is for you and I, is that we learn how to rethink our story. Now, memory is selective and interpretive. What I mean by that is that we choose the memories that we consciously want to dwell on. We, we interpret them in certain ways. And so... I remember and I, and I interpret those memories in my own way. Now, I could give you an idea of this because I'll just tell you, I, I like to think that I was a decent athlete. I had a very brief uh, college career as a soccer player uh, before I was injured and then just basically let it ride out. And I like to think that I was pretty good, but the interesting thing is that the older that I get, the better I was right? The older that I get, the better athlete I actually was. It's amazing how my memory is changing over time to make me an even better athlete than I probably actually was, right? It's because my memories are selective and interpretive, right? It's been said before that lending someone money is one of the primary causes of amnesia, right? Because when you lend somebody money, it's almost like you're causing them to forget that they owe you. It's happened to me before when people lend me money. I'm like, really? Did I? I forgot. I forgot to pay you back. So this is the thing. Our memories can be selective and interpretive. What we remember about our lives and about our stories is really important because those memories define who we are today. They root us in who we are today, and they actually determine who we are becoming tomorrow. This man in our story had been lame for 38 years. He'd been unable to walk for 38 years. That's a very specific number that the Bible gives to us. It doesn't say just a really long time or most or all of his life. It says 38 years, and I believe that that's specific because I think he was keeping count. I think that, the, that, that his lameness was what was defining him in his mind. He's by the pool of Bethesda, so close, but he couldn't get in. He tells Jesus, everybody else gets down to the water before I can. And it's that sort of discouragement, seeing somebody else get the stuff that you are hoping for, seeing somebody else live in the, in the dream that you have dreamed for yourself. It's that kind of discouragement that can actually make a person feel cursed It can define a person's identity. And the problem is, after you have known for so long, if all you've known for that long a time is lameness, you might actually lose your appetite for wholeness. If all you've ever known is dysfunction in a family, then it might be a problem because that memory of dysfunction might cause you uh, to pick the guy who mistreats you because to you, that's normal. It might actually cause you to, to look at the nice guy, the guy who treats you right, and say, you know what? He's boring. I'm going to go for this guy. But the problem isn't the nice guy. The problem is actually the dysfunction that has been normalized in your life. If all you've ever known is debt in your life, it might be hard for you. The minute you see dollars come in, the minute you, it might be difficult for you to look at dollars in an account and say, you know what? I don't know, I don't know what to do with that savings because debt has become normal. And financial health is out of your experience. 
Jesus asked the man what seems like a cruel question, I think. He says, would you like to get well? It's a fascinating question because to the guy who'd been lame for 38 years, he must have been like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are, you, are you joking? Seriously? I mean, here this guy waltzes in, and it's clear that he's got some importance because there are people following him, and he picks this man out of the crowd of different people there, and he asks him, do you want to get well? Seriously? But Jesus is wise enough to know that this, this man's problem goes deeper than legs that don't work, right? This, that's why I'm talking about debt. Debt is a problem that goes deeper than bank accounts and dollars earned, Dysfunction in families and relationships is a problem that goes deeper than somebody else's issues. Jesus speaks to the man and says, do you want to be well? Because for 38 years, the story that he has told himself is, I am cursed. Others get blessed while I watch. Others get accepted while I get rejected and considered less than. This is the problem, is that it's possible for people to develop their whole sense of identity around the wounds, past wounds and dysfunction that, that have defined them now. Their past is defining their present, and it is also determining their future. And so I want to ask you today, what parts of your story are you remembering, and how are you remembering them? Who is the narrator of your story? Is it the person who left you? Is it the words that they said to you or about you? Is it the doubters? Is it the haters? The Bible says this about Jesus, that he is the author of our faith. And I want to take that word literally today as we think about this and say, what if you were to allow Jesus to be the one who was narrating your story? What if Jesus was the one who was, who was actually writing your story? Joseph, in the Old Testament, he understood this. At the end of Genesis, we see the most astounding example of flipping the script in the Old Testament, in the entire Old Testament, at the end of this, this, this long string of betrayals and justices and disappointments, Joseph does exactly what I'm talking about. He says this, hey, I know my brothers betrayed me, but I'm going to rethink this. I'm going to reinterpret this. I know that I was sold into slavery, but i got to rethink that. I, I know that I was falsely accused, and, and I was imprisoned and forgotten and left for dead, but I've got to rethink this today. If God is the one writing my story, then he meant it for good. That's why Joseph said what was intended for evil, God intended for good. What was meant to harm me, God intended to bless me. It is flipping the script today, and I want you to see that. That God does not erase disappointments from our lives. He does not erase pain or loss. He simply gives us the grace and the power and the wisdom to reinterpret them and to understand them in a different way. Our struggles and our failures take on a different meaning when we follow Jesus. How curious would it be, I think, if we were to transport someone from first century Rome here to today, and we were to bring them into a church building or to bring them into a jewelry store, think about that, and to show them all the beautiful gold and silver crosses that, that, that are there for sale. I mean, imagine what a first century Roman would be thinking looking at, at those crosses. He'd be thinking, why would you put that around your neck? That is an ugly symbol. To the first century Roman, the cross was a symbol of guilt and punishment but I want you to see this today. God did not erase the cross with Jesus. He took an instrument of torture and he turned it into a symbol, a transformation and life. And God can do that. Reinterpret every disappointment, every hardship that you've experienced if you'll allow him to. Are you able, are you willing to flip the script today? That's what Jesus is asking this man. After 38 years of disappointment, are you ready to embrace something different? And I want to say this to you today. Our mindset needs to change before the miracle can take place in our lives. Our mindset has to be different. That's why Jesus addresses this first before he tells him to get up and walk. He says, are you ready? Are you willing? I think that's why I encourage people all the time to get into, into, into groups. New city groups are important because this is what happens in a group is we actually begin to speak life to one another. 
We come prepared to listen to stories and to tell our story in a way and, and to invite others to help us to rewrite that, reinterpret it through the lens of God's grace in our lives. You see, if you want to hang around with cynical, uh, you know, ugly people who will be negative and talk ugly about others, then what's going to happen in you is you're just going to become that way too. But if you want to be around somebody who's going to speak life, then I say you need to be intentional about that. That's why I encourage you when we start groups in a couple weeks, get somewhere where you can have people speaking life and helping you to see how God's purposes are at work even in the middle of your pain. We have groups for men and women and couples and finances and all kinds of different things that you could be a part of. I, I, just, I just think it's so important that we invite others to help us to do this work of flipping the script. Because what if God is still writing your story? And what if, by some mystery of His will, your past disappointments don't have to determine future possibilities? What if you were to look through those experiences with a different set of lenses and to say, you know what, that time that I was weak and broken, that was the time when God showed His strength. That time when I experienced loss, that was the time when God showed His sufficiency. That failure, that was the moment where God showed His incredible grace for me. That's called flipping the script. And if you want to go into 2021 prepared to win the day, it's the first thing you need to do. The second thing is this. Bury your yesterdays. When Jesus asked the man, do you want to be well? He was asking him, are you willing to leave this place behind? Are you willing to walk free? In 2010, the New York Jets lost to the New England Patriots in a humiliating home game defeat, 45 to 3. It was a joke, right? After the game, the coach of the Jets was named Rex Ryan. He took the entire team out on the field. And I don't know if he asked permission to do this or not, but he literally dug a hole in the football field and he buried the, the game ball, the football from that game. And he basically held a funeral with the team present and said, we're going to put this loss to rest. We're going to have a funeral for that game so that we can move on to something different. And I don't know whether it was just chance or I don't know if it was because of this incredible, uh, you know, kind of symbolism that the coach kind of invited the team to experience. Six weeks later, the same Jets and the same Patriots faced off for the AFC uh, semifinals, and the Jets beat the Patriots to advance to the AFC championship. There is something powerful, I think, about being willing to bury your yesterdays. Jesus was saying, are you willing to leave this behind? Because even though it might have been dis disappointment, after 38 years, it's become comfortable. It's become familiar. I want to remind you today, Jesus did not come handing out blankets and warm drinks. <laughs> he did not come just to make us comfortable. He came to confront us in our dysfunction. He came to confront us in our sin and even in our brokenness, to challenge us to be willing to bury our yesterdays. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and he was recounting something that he had experienced. And I want you to see this in, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us again. On Him we have set our hope that He'll continue delivering us. This is what the Apostle Paul said. He's saying, don't forget about when we were in the province of Asia and we were under such great pressure that it took us past our limits. I think 2020 was a year, if I could, if I could define 2020, it was a year where a bunch of people discovered their limits. <laughs> right? We, we found out that we are not all sufficient. Every leader discovered their limits. Every parent discovered their limits. Every teenager discovered. Everyone seemed to find this place that was like, man, we were under such great pressure 
And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says. He says, we got so under so much pressure that we despaired of life itself. What he's saying is we did not even want to live. And if it's the Apostle Paul saying it, then I want you to see it's possible for you to, to be depressed and to be despairing and still be a Christian. It's possible for you to feel like you are crumbling and still be a Christian. It's possible to feel defeated and to still be a Christian. Paul says, all of this happened in us so that we would learn that we cannot rely on ourselves, but we would rely on God. You see, I think as we get older, we mature. And it's not a product of time. It's a product of whether or not we learn these truths we start as a young, young person and a child maybe, and we rely on everybody around us. We rely on our parents. We rely on everyone else. But then there comes a point at some, at some point as we're growing up where we realize we've been let down. We've been, you know, and, and some people say, you know what? I'm going to have to learn to rely on myself. I'm just going to rely on myself because I can't count on those other people. And the more experiences that you have of being let down, the more, you know, the more deeply that gets ingrained in us. I'm going to rely on myself. But let me tell you, that's not maturity. That's not the end game that God has in mind. I I know too many Christians who rely on themselves. They they, they, they think that they're going to bootstrap it and pull themselves up and pick themselves up and say, you know, I got this, you know, because, you know, maybe with a little help from Jesus, I can get this done. But this is what Paul is saying. Paul says, we couldn't even trust ourselves. We couldn't even rely on ourselves. We had to learn to rely on God. And that was God's purpose in it all. We rely on God who raises the dead. I want you to see this. God worked for them while they were depressed. God worked on their behalf while they had lost hope. Even, I I would say this, even in the moment where they had despaired of life itself, God was working on their behalf. And I would tell you today, you can't understand this if you haven't been broken like this. I, I gotta tell you, until you have been broken past your limits in this way, you don't understand that you don't get through this stuff because you're better. I didn't come to get through to this point in my life because I'm better. I didn't come through it because I'm stronger. I came through it because the Lord carried me, picked me up when I could not pick myself up and stood me up because that's the grace of God. That's what God can do. He can raise you up. He can raise dead hearts, dead hopes, dead dreams, dead joys. He is the God who has delivered, who is delivering, and who will deliver us, Paul said. So Jesus tells the man, I want to raise you up. If you're willing, I can make you walk again. Because it really wasn't a question of the power of Jesus to do it. It was the question of the man's willingness to walk it out. So I want to say this today to you. Can you be free? Are you willing to bury the past? Those things that have defined you, that are contrary to what God says about you, will you put them aside and lay them to rest? There's something powerful when you decide to break up with your yesterdays. You might need to hold a funeral for those labels that were attached to you. You might need to hold a funeral for those experiences that have defined you, those losses that are still defining you today so that you can walk into the present day grace and goodness of God. The problem is that a lot of times what's what's at work inside of us is working against what God wants to do in and through us. It's hard to break up with yourself, right? And so, I mean, when you think about it, I think many of us have realized this. The battle begins in our own hearts. The battle begins with our own, with our own nature. This is what Paul was talking about in Romans 7 when he said it like this. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I, I see another law working in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. Paul's saying, I, I would love to, but I found it difficult to break up with myself. <laughs> he says, even though I know what I ought to do, I'm, 
I'm carrying around this old way with me, and I feel like a prisoner to it. And I want you to, I want you to know today, I think Paul had a particular image that he would have, been, that he would have had in mind somewhere in his experience because he says, no matter where I go, it goes with me. When I want to do right, I get twisted up and turned around and because I got this old nature attached to me. But in Paul's day, the Romans, they had a, they had a, a punishment for murder that was as bad as anything that I've ever heard of. In certain cases, the dead body would not be buried, but it would be chained to the back of the murderer. <laughs> All right, just think of that as an image. It was a cruel but effective way of reminding the perpetrator of the crime that he had committed. And there was no escaping it, right? It was almost worse than, than a death penalty because over time, that body that had been chained to that, to, that, to that person would decay and would fester and would decompose until it began to infect the guilty party. It was the past chained to the present and bringing death. And if that isn't a metaphor for what so many people experience today, I don't know what it is. The past chained to the present bringing death. And I know that Paul's audience in Rome would have had this in mind when he continued on in that same passage. The next line that he says, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Who is going to unchain me? Who's going to help me to get free of this past? And then his next thing that he says, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. It's free. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Because I feel like I'm carrying around this, this, this past and I've tried to free myself, but I can't do it. I've tried to get my friends to help me, but they can't do it. I tried to get my spouse to do it, but they don't have what it takes. I did my best, but it wasn't enough. I did everything I could, but it wasn't enough. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. I'm free. You can be free today. It's possible to bury your past, to be free of that old past, and to let it be buried and dead and gone in Christ. That's why Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and who gave himself for me. He says that old past was crucified with Jesus. And then Colossians, he says, having been buried with Jesus in baptism, you're raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And like he said later on, who raises the dead. Today, it's possible to bury your past. And anything that is contrary to God's plan and purpose for your present and for your future, to put it to rest, to shake it off, to break the chains. It only happens because of what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross. Sinners like you and me, that he went to the cross, living a life that you and I should have lived and dying a death that we deserve to die. It would not be possible were it not for Jesus. Now today, wherever you are, if this is something that you need to be free, to be forgiven of that past and to receive the grace of God and the power of God to set you free from past sins and past wounds and the effects of sin, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avails for me, the old hymn says. If that's you today, I want to invite you where you are to pray a prayer with me and to receive the grace of God. It doesn't matter where you are right now. It doesn't matter what time it is. God is always on the lookout for anyone who would call on Him in this way. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer today just believing that God can make you free. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin my shame and my guilt and you died for it you faced hell for me so i wouldn't have to you rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth and a relationship with the father today lord jesus i turn from my sin to be born again 
I bury my past to be made new. Thank you, Lord. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.